We have the privilege, once again, as we do each week, to come to God's Word. And so with that, I would encourage you to turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And as you're turning there, I want to uh, share with you a quote that I read this week uh, regarding effective Bible study. It is um, what I believe and what I've tried to build my ministry upon, these simple principles for effective Bible preaching, effective Bible study. Effective Bible study is built on three key questions. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible mean? And how does it apply to our lives? Uh, in other words, when we take Bible study methods, we, we like to say uh, Bible study consists of observation, interpretation, and application. Observation, what does it say? Interpretation, what does it mean? And of course, application. How does it apply to my life? And the quote of this pastor said, Each of those questions is important, but applying the word must always be the highest goal. For knowledge without application is useless. As so we come to Romans chapter 12, I think we are in the most uh, practical aspect of the book of Romans. The application part of the very long sermon that Paul has given to us in the book of Romans. This wonderful treatise on the gospel. Uh, we are going to consider what are the marks of the genuine Christian. And how should believers relate to one another. How should believers relate to the outside world and even towards the government. And so with that introduction, I'd like us to read verses 9 through 21 of Romans chapter 12. Beginning in verse 9, Paul writes, Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink, for by doing so you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we seek uh, to convey your truth this morning, I pray that you would be merciful to allow me to say what the Word says. And even more importantly, I pray that you would allow this truth to go deep into our hearts, that by your Spirit you would apply it to our lives, that we would be changed, that we would be transformed from one degree of glory to another, that we would be conformed to the image of your dear Son, in whose name I pray. Amen. I think if we are going to consider once again this morning this idea of genuine Christian love that I began two weeks ago in verses uh, 9 and 10. And I think what we are saying here as we come to this practical aspect is conveyed in hymn number 429. I don't know if anybody has that hymn memorized, but hymn 429 has the verses that go something like this. Uh, we are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit, we are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity will one day be restored. We will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand, we will walk with each other, we will walk hand in hand, and together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. We will work with each other, we will work side by side. We will work with each other, we will work side by side, and we'll guard each man's dignity and save each man's pride. All praise to the Father from whom all things come. All praise to Christ Jesus, His only Son. All praise to the Spirit who makes us one. And of course, the chorus, which you may have figured out by now. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. By our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. 
Uh, I think this is fitting because this is what Paul is telling us to look for in our lives in terms of discerning whether we have the reality of salvation. If we've truly been saved by grace, uh, we will demonstrate that in acts of love. When we confess our sins to God and we trust in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are given a new nature. We are brought into a new family. We have new relationships with one another. And he gives us brothers and sisters in Christ, namely the church. Not only do we have Jesus our Savior and God as our Father and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us, but we have brothers and sisters in Christ that we, we refer to as our family, the church. And as a family, God is concerned in how we live alongside one another in this new relationship. So in a word, by way of all this introduction, the mark of the genuine Christian is love, is love. Christ said to his disciples, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. And later in chapter 13, Paul is going to say that the, the summary of, of all of the law, the, new, the commandment, is to not only love God, but to love one another. And of course, this is a, a theme that is not new to you. It's all throughout the Bible. It's all throughout the New Testament. But Paul gives us a practical test by which we can discern how we're doing in truly loving as we should love. And we looked last week at four principles of genuine Christian love, or, or two weeks ago, in verses 9 and 10. Let me just review those quickly. In verse 9, we said that Christian love is sincere. Uh, it is without wax. It's not hypocritical. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not insincere flattery, but it is truly genuine in verse 9. And we also said, secondly, that Christian love is discriminating because in order to love sincerely, uh, we have to discriminate from, well, as Paul says, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Much of what is um, portrayed as love in our culture is, is tolerance, but Paul is saying that love is, dis is discriminating. It, it, it loves what God loves and it hates what God hates. And so it's not loving, for example, to let our brothers and sisters wallow in sin and go down a path of destruction. So love is discriminating. And we learn in verse 10 that love is brotherly. Again, we see this theme of the family. Love one another, verse 10, with brotherly affection. This idea of, of, of being together in the family of God. And then finally, two weeks ago, we considered that Christian love is honoring one another. Outdo one another, the last part of verse 10, in showing honor. In other words, we're not propping up our own agenda. We're not into self-promotion. But what we should be doing is seeking to honor one another and build up one another and lift one another up. And then this morning, continuing along that theme, I want to consider three more marks of genuine Christian love in verses 11 through 13. Uh, now, some commentators, uh, if you were to read through this text, you would see that there are many commands. And you, you, some see 9, 12, 13 commands. I'm just going to take them a verse at a time. So, number one, for this morning's purposes, Christ, genuine Christian love is enthusiastically serving. It's enthusiastically serving. Verse 11. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Again, it looks like three different commands, but I'm going to take it as one verse. Suffice it to say, whatever is worth doing in the Christian life is worth doing enthusiastically. It is worth doing with our whole heart. Uh, the NIV translates it this way, Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. In, in other words, don't be spiritually lazy. Um, sloth and indifference uh, not only prevent good, but allow evil to prosper. All that has to happen for weeds to grow is that you just don't tend to the garden, right? You understand that. It's just being indifferent or, or slothful in our, in, well, the King James calls it in our business. Take that for what it is. Our business in the Lord or our business outside of, of the church. Whatever it is, Paul is calling us not to be spiritually lazy. And he has this peculiar uh, phrase here, fervent in spirit. And as I was going to chase that down a little bit, it literally means to boil in spirit. Now, this phrase is suggesting having plenty of energy to accomplish the task for which God has 
given to us, but not overboiling or not just running willy-nilly. You get the idea. We hear phrases like people, he's white hot for Jesus or he's on fire for the Lord. And, and certainly that, that is a good context. But, but Paul is saying that we are to be, to be having the kind of energy and passion, enthusiasm in serving the Lord that, that is not waning. If you think about to literally boil, I'm reminded of Revelation 3 from our study where Jesus says, I would rather you be either hot or cold, but lukewarm. I mean, either you're, you're on fire for the Lord or you're cold. At least we know where you're at. But to be, to be lukewarm, Jesus says, well, that is repulsive to him. This idea of keeping up our passion and our enthusiasm in serving the Lord is, is all throughout the Scriptures. For example, in Galatians 6, 9, Paul said, Let us not become weary in doing good. Let's not grow tired of doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. And elsewhere, I won't, I won't give you the verses, but Paul refers to the Christian life as a race. He refers to the Christian life as, as fighting, as pressing on, as, as pursuing something, as enthusiastically going after something, as we like to say, following hard after Christ. This is what Paul is reminding us to do. But yet, he's telling us we don't do it in our own strength. We don't serve the Lord and pursue the Lord in our own strength alone any more than we are saved by our own efforts. It is the Holy Spirit working in us that strengthens us for the ministry. I read earlier from Colossians chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. We proclaim Him, warning everyone, admonishing everyone, if you will, teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may, with a practical purpose, present everyone mature in Christ, that people would be built up in Christ. And then Paul says this, For this I toil. It sounds like work to me in the Lord. It sounds like we're, you know, toil. You think of a labor. For this purpose, Paul says, I labor, but not according to my efforts, but according to all his energy that powerfully works within me. Now, I say this to remind myself and to remind you, because if you've served the Lord for a number of years, you know how it can become tiring. You know that if you've been a Christian for any length of time, it's hard to keep our zeal and stay enthusiastic in serving. Why is that? Well, we, we can become, if I can say that, we can become jaded sometimes in the ministry where we're serving for a length of time and we don't feel that we're getting maybe the appreciation that we deserve or, or in our service, no one seems to recognize what we are doing or recognizing our efforts. We can feel like nobody honors our service, even though we're told in texts like this to, to honor one another. And after a while, you can get tired and our bodies wear down and, and we just don't have the energy we once had. I think we can relate to that. Now that may be true of our physical condition, but that shouldn't dampen our spiritual fervor. Because Paul is not telling us to be focused on our physical energy He's telling us to be fervent in the spirit, in our spiritual energy. And if you don't mind me saying this, I think a lot of what is called burnout in the ministry or people dropping out of the ministry and is often, not always, not, not always, but is often a loss of not physical energy, spiritual energy. But praise God, the Lord knows our frame, does he not? He knows, he knows our weaknesses, and He tells us to draw on Him in prayer to, to get strength. He, he knows that we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The Lord knows our frame, and He calls us to serve with joy and enthusiasm. And I would say when we grow cold, it's because we take our eyes off the one whom we're serving. We grow cold in our service when we forget the mercies of God that Paul reminds us of in the first few verses. And the longer we've been a Christian, the longer we've been serving, the more passionate we should be. God knows what we need, and He calls us to be refreshed in the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul isn't saying, listen, I know you've been serving the church 20, 30, 40, 50. I know you've been serving the Lord a long time, so why don't you take a break and go recharge your batteries? No, he's saying, why don't you let God recharge your batteries? 
The RSV, the Revised Standard Version, has an interesting translation of uh, this phrase, be fervent in the Spirit. Listen to this. It says, being aglow with the Spirit. Aglow. Right? I mean, whether the word spirit in this text is referring to the human spirit or the Holy Spirit, I'm not that concerned because commentators believe it could be either one. Be fervent in the spirit. What, my human spirit? You want me to be fervent in my spirit? Well, well, the only way I can be fervent in my spirit is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So, so take it for what it is. We could read it this way. Let your spirit be aglow with the Holy Spirit. In the late Donald Gray Barnhouse at 10th Street Presbyterian, he, he wrote this, The glow of the Spirit is the warmth of the soul touched by the love of Christ. It cannot exist apart from the knowledge that we've been loved, that Christ gave himself for our sins, that we've been redeemed, and that the Holy Spirit has come to dwell in our hearts. Such knowledge causes us to yield in full surrender to him as Lord of all. The Holy Spirit who dwells in all believers will glow through those who allow him to fill and direct their lives. So Paul says, be fervent in the Spirit. Serve the Lord. And I think what he's doing here is reminding us that if we're on fire for Christ, then there has to be an object for this, for this fire, for this glow. You know, see, see, there is a purpose that we're to be fervent in the Spirit, and that is to serve the Lord. And Paul gives us the purpose here. It's not just being on fire for Christ for the sake of being on fire. It's not purely an emotional or an ecstatic experience. It is, it is being fervent in the Spirit directed at something, namely the cause of Christ and the cause of the gospel. Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 5 says, No one lights a lamp to put it under a basket, but he puts it on a stand to let it light the whole house. So if someone's truly on fire for the Lord, it'll demonstrate itself in serving others. So the question I ask all of us, myself, is are we growing, growing slack in, in the things of the Lord? Are we as... Uh, Hebrews 12 says, letting our hands droop and our knees buckle. If so, then ask the Lord to refresh you. Ask the Lord to revive you by His Spirit so that we can enthusiastically serve the Lord. Second, genuine Christian love is patiently, prayerfully persevering. Sorry for the alliteration, but I have to get one in once in a while. Patiently, prayerfully persevering. Verse 12 Paul goes on to say, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. And again, it would seem like three different action items, three commands, but I think perseverance is what, what binds it all together. This is what the Christian life is a life of persevering, to, of pressing on, enduring, overcoming, continuing, if you will. Back in chapter 8, verse 18, Paul talks about this idea of being patient in tribulation, rejoicing in hope, but he says it this way, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth being compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Because, brothers and sisters, the Christian life is difficult. It, it, the world is not always a friendly place to be a Christian. But in Christ, we're assured that all things work together for good. And we have the full assurance of our salvation and the full assurance of God's intended outcome for our lives. We have this hope that does not disappoint, Paul says in chapter 5, and the, the reality that one day all our troubles will pass away is really the, the fuel that causes us to endure. This is not forever. The tribulations, the sufferings, the trials, the, the injustices, what, what, fill in the blank, it's temporary. And it's nothing to be compared to the eternal way to glory that is waiting us. All our troubles will pass away, so we should be optimistic and hopeful about the future. People say, hey, you watch the news lately? I'm like, well, I try not to, trust me. <laughs> well, you know what happens, and you know, and this could be the end, and this is, and things are, I'm like, whatever. The Lord is in control. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you know, the news comes and goes, but the Lord reigns, right? Someone once said, the, the Lord is on the throne, and that's all you really need to know. And I'm sorry to be simplistic about it, but, you know, there's so many things that come and go that people get so upset about. We need to 
think about what Christ has promised in his word. For example, we could just paraphrase verse 12 this way. Seeing as we have this hope in Christ, what are we to do? Rejoice. Insofar as we suffer tribulation, what? Be patient. With respect to prayer, be constant. Be devoted. Be strong in prayer. If you want to know how to endure this life, here you go. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Why? Because this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Now, it is so plain to us, but yet so difficult for us. This is why we have the repetition of the scriptures reminding us, trust in the Lord. Be prayerful in season all the time. Be constant in prayer. Why? Because prayer is dependence upon God. Psalm 121, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Is that your testimony? Where does your help come from? Now, sadly, tribulations are an excuse or sometimes a reason for people to move away from the Lord rather than to be drawn near to the Lord. But being constant in prayer, being devoted in prayer is what we're called to do. It's so much that Jesus, when he talks about prayer to the disciples, he just says, when you pray. It's almost like he assumes, when you pray, when you pray, when you pray. Now, if, if you should ever think of taking up the discipline of prayer, this is what you ought to... No, it's just assumed. It's as natural as breathing. Prayer. My spirit testifies with his spirit that I'm a child of God. It is by the spirit of God that we cry, Abba, Father. And all that Jesus said regarding prayer can be summarized in the phrase, when you pray. Certainly he was a model for prayer. Now I can think in my own experience and in the experience of those I had the opportunity to be with that there are only two reasons why we don't pray. Number one, we don't think we need God's help. Or number two, we don't think that God can help. Matthew Henry said that a life without prayer is a life without God. Spurgeon said that a prayerless life is a Christless life. How's your prayer life? Are you consistent, devoted, strong, continually, persevering, pressing on in prayer? There is nothing more that will mark your life out and transform your life and the life of those around you than your prayer life. I admit it's a struggle to remain faithful in prayer. Our minds wander. We don't know what to say, but praise God the Spirit helps us. Amen? So ask God. When people ask me, what can I pray for you for, Pastor? I say, prayer, pray for my prayer life. Pray for my prayer life. <laughs> right? Genuine Christian love is enthusiastically serving. It is patiently, prayerfully persevering. And genuine Christian love, third, is practical. It's the only thing I could think of here. It's practical. Verse 13. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Now perhaps I've lumped these two qualities into, into one, but they're seemingly obvious and, and almost mundane qualities that we see uh, personified in Jesus and in Paul is this. When others have a need, we should meet it. When, when brothers and sisters have a need, let us meet those needs. Let us help those in need. Novel idea. Remember, we're talking about the outward expression of the Christian life. And to me, nothing is more practical than meeting the needs of other believers, whether it's in the context here or believers in another context. This word contribute is a form of the word koinonia, which is translated fellowship or partnership. So we see this in the book of Acts, that they had partnership, they had things in common, they, they, they shared with each as each had a need. They were devoted to one another. They, they, they shared. Galatians 6, I quoted earlier, verse 9, verse 10 says, So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially those who are the household of faith. So, very practical, right? Practical expression is contribute and meet the needs of the saints. Take up an offering. We, we give to mission work. Whatever that is, we, we may reach into our pocket and meet the needs of another. Just 
without even announcing it. Whatever it is, Paul tells us, that's an expression of genuine Christian love, meeting the needs of others. We also see from the text, not only meeting the needs of the saints, but we are to be hospitable. As we are called to meet the needs of others as we have opportunity, believers and unbelievers, we look for opportunities to show hospitality to both as well. You probably know the context of the first century that, that inns were very scarce and expensive and often dangerous, so Christians would commonly open their homes to other believers and, and show hospitality. And sometimes they would show hospitality to strangers. And what a wonderful way to show the love of Christ then by hospitality. It is a characteristic sign of genuine love and marks of genuine salvation that we live this way, that we love this way. As believers, we're part of the family of God, brothers and sisters. We have a new family, and God has given us His Word and instructed us how to live as a family, how to live with one another, even with all the dynamics that take place within the family. When we rub one another and when we get in each other's nerves or whatever it may be, God gives us his word and tells us this is how we are to live with one another. Work this out in the lives, in the context of the church. He has given us our, his spirit to enable us to fulfill those commands. To, to love as he has called us to love. And beginning in verse 14 and continuing on, uh, Paul is going to begin kind of a new emphasis in terms of uh, how we are to demonstrate genuine Christian love to the outside world, even those who, who persecute us or maybe revile. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. Bless do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Well, we're going to see, verse 17, uh, how we are to act in terms of those who, who may do evil to us. How we are to live at peace with others as much as possible with us. Never avenging yourself. Leaving it all to the Lord. Uh, nothing more practical than that, right? But make no mistake about it, judgment begins with the household of God. And so I'm going to conclude here in verses 9 through 13 that I believe this is in the context of the church family. We, we should be doing good to one another. We should be growing in our love and, and grace with one another. I know uh, Steve has done the membership class, and I don't know if he covered this in the class or not, but our mission statement here at the church, I, I don't talk about it very much because mission statements, what do they mean? But uh, worship God, love others, and reach the world. And I, and I believe as we talked about that, it's just something simple, but it, but it begins with worship. Romans 12, present yourself as a living sacrifice, which is your spiritual worship. It begins there. It begins with presenting ourselves holy and blameless before the Lord. Why? By the mercies of God, because we've experienced the mercy of God in saving us from our sins through Christ's death and resurrection. We present ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. God has endowed us with per certain spiritual gifts. Each and every one of us has a gift, and He has called us to use it in the context of serving one another. He has called us to love one another and to get along with one another, and to show honor to one another, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe that this worship is the basis for which our love of one another flows out. And, and what's the song say? Well, the whole world will know we're Christians by what? By our love. What did Jesus say in John 13? By our love for one another. I don't think there's anything more practical than that. To so be giving yourself over to Christ, submit yourself to Christ by faith. And let Christ work in you. You have peace through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You've been reconciled to God through Christ. And through Christ, we can be reconciled one to another. And we can grow into maturity, into the statue of Christ, who is our head. And as a result of that, it will have an effect on the outside world. Um, I, I didn't begin thinking about our mission as a church by saying we need to go reach the world. Now, that's noble. I mean, that's the Great Commission. But if we're not living as the church, as God calls us to live, how effective are we going to be? So that's my encouragement to you. If we aren't growing in grace and love in the church, how can we expect to be a witness in the world? Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you for the church, for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We thank you that we are one in the spirit and we are linked together because we are united in Christ. And we pray, Father, that as we think about our lives, uh, that we would be uh, practicing these one another's that are listed here. And that we would be renewed in our spirit and that we would be refreshed so that we come into the ministry with, with zeal and excitement so that we don't grow weary in doing good because your word tells us that our time is short and that we should be about the business of the Lord. So help us with that, Father. Give us a, a meaningful prayer life that we would be devoted in prayer for one another, that we would be constant and, and give us a generous heart, Lord, that we would contribute to the needs of the saints and show hospitality. We pray, Father, that the world would truly know that we have been with Jesus and that we would, they would know that we are Christians, not just by the words that we say, but by the lives we live. Father, I'm reminded of the quote we read a couple weeks ago that so many people um, preach Christ. Uh, let us resolve to live Christ, not only preach. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed. Thank you.